All right, <clears throat> settle down. Welcome back, everybody. Uh, boy, did I just hear the tail end of a cool talk in the previous class. There's a guy who was sequencing DNA and solving medical mysteries. But um, all right, so now we're back to operating systems. Um, so uh, if you remember from last time, we talked about uh, the clock algorithm a little bit. And um, the reason it's called the clock algorithm is because you can make it look like a clock. Basically, imagine putting all of the pages in a giant ring, and we're going to slowly walk through them as we need new pages, uh, trying to decide which ones are free and which aren't. And uh, just as a refresher, we also talked briefly about the page table entries. And so... Um, there are essentially four bits, the use, modified, valid, and read-only bits. Sometimes modified is called dirty. And uh, the clock algorithm basically uses at least the use bit to decide whether pages are busy or not. And uh, the simple idea is very uh, just you set the, the use bit to zero, and then when you go around, when you come back to it later, if it's uh, gone to a one, you know that somebody's touched it. And so typically the use bit is done in software, or excuse me, typically the use bit is handled by hardware, but you can handle it in software as we discussed. So were there any questions about this clock algorithm? All right. So the key thing about the clock algorithm is really what I say at the bottom here. It's crudely partitioning the pages into... Uh, Two groups, young and old. Is that better? Not quite so echoey to everybody. Okay. And um, so the the not old pages are the ones that people are still using, and the old pages are ones that aren't getting used in the complete loop. Okay. So the other thing was the second chance list algorithm. That actually partitioned into two pieces, and this was originally a response to the fact that the VAX was designed without a use bit, and uh, so the idea is you have some pages in the green category here that are just marked for free use and other ones that are marked invalid. And uh, if a page is uh, accessed by the processor that's in the green, uh, it just gets used and you have no idea that it's been touched or not. And so the best we can do on the green side is manage these in FIFO order, as I mentioned. The other here, you know every time something's touched over here because these are all marked invalid, so you always get a page fault when you touch one of the yellow pages. And uh, the idea was really if you try to access a page that's not in the green, you get a page fault either because it's on the yellow side, in which case you um, take the oldest FIFO page, put it in the uh, overflow category at the end of the LRU list, pull the page you page faulted on back to the front, and you're good. Otherwise, uh, if you have to pull it off of disk, you pull the new page in off of disk and kick an LRU out uh, back to disk. Were there any questions on this? So notice this essentially, remember this essentially approximates LRU in a different way in that we have a some number of pages over here that we don't know anything about their use patterns, but these are managed strictly LRU via a list. Okay? All right. Now... Um, I also mentioned briefly this idea of a reverse page mapping, which is uh, comes up for many reasons, not the least of which is that a single physical page gets shared by multiple processes sometimes, and uh, lots of reasons, not the least of which are forking and so on, right, um, and shared memory. And so we need some way, when we're about to kick one page out of somebody's page table back out to disk, we got to be able to trace down everybody else who's referencing that page, and uh, whatever it is, it's got to be fast, because uh, when you're about to do this uh, um, kicking back out to disk, you've got to hunt down every page uh, table that's pointing at it and do it quickly. And there's uh, many options here. You could keep a linked list, uh, which is very expensive. Linux actually keeps um, regions of memory that are uh, thought of as kind of objects that are actually kept in this reverse list, and everything gets mapped as an object. Um, so this is a kind of the reverse of a page table. Were there any questions on this? Okay. So um, I did want to, before we totally left memory, I wanted to say a little bit about uh, memory management in a real operating system like Linux uh, or Pintos has uh, some similar mechanisms. But um, Linux in particular was designed for 
several different versions of the x86, and so memory management gets a lot more complicated than what I said. For instance, there are three different zones. There's called the DMA zone, which is less than the, the first 16 megabytes of memory. We have the normal zone, which is everything from 16 megabytes to 896 megabytes, and then there's the high memory zone, which is everything else. Anybody have any idea why we would do something so goofy? And by the way, when I'm dividing this up, I'm talking about physical memory in the DRAM. So this is the first 16 megabytes of DRAM. This is another chunk. This is another chunk. Does anybody know why we would do something so goofy? Yeah. Say it again. You know, uh, it is indirectly related to shorter addresses for DMAs. Anybody, but you're on the right track. Does anybody want to take another stab? You're on the right track. Remember, legacy. Okay, it's all about what was there before. So the original versions of the x86, you could only do direct memory access from lower memory. And so if you were trying to set up a device driver to do direct memory access, you had to be able to allocate that special memory that had small, short addresses, and that was a hardware limitation. Nothing about software. And then the ones above the 896 have to do with uh, the fact that Linux maps every page, physical page, into kernel space, so the kernel can always touch every physical page without any trouble. And so... Um, and then high mem being above that, often in the uh, some of the original uh, days of x86 processors, you actually had to do some weird bank switching to even touch that memory. So history. Um, every zone has one free list, okay, and two LRU lists. So you can think of this as one free list, two clock lists, uh, many different allocators attached to it. So there's slab allocators, per page allocators, uh, many different types of memory allocation. So in Linux, for instance, you can get what's called anonymous memory, which is just allocating chunks of memory uh, for heap or stack. And then uh, mapped memory is memory that directly reflects the contents of a file. So I think we've done mmap in at least one of your homeworks. Or have we done mmap? We have, right? Um, not yet. Okay, so you can take a file and you can do what's called an mmap to it into your memory, and now when you read and write that memory, it's as if you're reading and writing the file without actually having to do read and write system calls. Okay? So, um, different types of memory, different allocation priorities, so on. Lots of things, okay? So once you start looking at memory management, you guys think you're having fun with malloc, you ought to look at kalloc inside of the kernel. Okay? It's a mess because sometimes... Somebody who's calling it wants memory but can't afford to block because they're in a, in a device driver's interrupt routine and they'd crash the system. There are flags for that. Okay. Um, here was a quick uh, show you at uh, what the virtual memory maps look like for Linux. So you've already seen the one on the left. This is um, the memory map that is used typically for a 32-bit address space. The first uh, three gig of memory is used for um, the user. And then above this, the first 896 megabytes of physical memory has a spot in kernel space that you can just touch in the kernel without doing anything with it. And then the rest is uh, used in a various ways that are complicated. Over here, the 64-bit address space has considerably more space. So as you can imagine, we can map, uh, for instance, up to 64 uh, terabytes of physical memory into kernel space without having to do this weird 896 megabyte thing. So this is basically doesn't happen in a 64-bit address space. Okay. And by the way, this canonical hole, does anybody know what what's symmetrical about either side addresses of this hole? Look at the top of the bottom portion and the bottom of the top of the kernel address space. Yeah, so in fact, uh, this is a, an example of kind of a sign extension sort of thing. And so these are the only memory addresses the hardware even recognizes. If you tried to use one in here, you'd run into trouble. So there isn't actually 64 bits of 
virtual address space that the processor knows how to use. Okay? All right. Um, the kernel memory is not generally visible to users, but there's actually some of the kernel memory that gets exported to users. In some cases, there's a VDSO facility, so that's kind of interesting. There's uh, physical pages. If you were to go into the depths of the kernel allocation, you'd find that every page has a page structure associated with it, and that's the thing that gets put into a clock ring. Okay? Pages are all described, and, uh, and I already said this about 32 and 64-bit memory. Um, there are ways of allocating memory, so there's direct structures like alloc pages and alloc page, which you can grab a range of pages that are contiguous in physical space. And the reason you would do that was for things like DMA. Um, if we end up teaching my advanced OS class again with the uh, Linux, how many people would be interested in a Linux advanced OS class? I taught it for a while, um, two years. We might try to do it again. So you actually have to understand these flags when you uh, deal with this, for instance. Um, but uh, just like with malloc, there are ways here. These are physical pages you can allocate, not virtual pages. Um, then uh, I wanted to say a little bit about what's the equivalent of the clock algorithm. So there's this idea of page frame reclaiming, reclaiming algorithms. There's a bunch of entry points, like uh, when you're really low on memory, there's kind of the uh-oh, we're in trouble sort of entry point. Uh, when you're hibernating, there's an entry point that frees up all the memory that isn't necessary and writes the rest of it to disk. And there's a periodic reclaiming, which is the closest thing to the clock algorithm that's in Linux. And um, I think in a low on memory, you start flushing out the dirty pages so they're immediately usable. In the case of the periodic reclaiming, this is actually kind of an interesting equivalent of almost the end chance clock algorithm that I mentioned before, where things get pushed over from the active list into the inactive list, and if they stay there long enough, then they're reclaimed. End ch nth chance, if you guys remember that from before. Okay, any questions? I just wanted to give you a little flavor for how this ends up being in the reality. You know, nothing is as simple as it shows up in class, unfortunately. <laughs> um, I did want to say one last thing. How many people have heard of slab allocators? Okay, this is in the interior. Um, this is the equivalent of malloc, but um, inside the kernel. So this is a replacement for free lists that are hand-coded by users. And uh, the idea here is an interesting one. So you're dealing with malloc as a, as a general, malloc and free is a general thing that gets called for all types of objects in a program, right? You call malloc to malloc some amount of memory, you free it back up, and somehow that allocator has to figure out how to deal with the fact that you might ask for four bytes or 100 bytes or two bytes or 396 bytes, and it's got to do something there. Uh, that's not a, that leads to all sorts of fragmentation, right? How many people are having fun with fragmentation? This is a new, uh, in, yeah, fun with fragmentation. So the way the slab allocators work inside of kernels is if you know for a fact that you're going to do have a bunch of objects that you need to allocate free, allocate free, that are all exactly the same size, you make a slab allocator for it. Okay, what's a good example of that? The task structure for a process or a task. Okay, always the same size. And what you do with a slab allocator is you allocate it, and whenever you allocate an object, it comes off of the slab allocator for that particular type of object it gets initialized in the way that that object is, and then when you free it, it gets put back there, and it doesn't have to be reinitialized even because you freed it, with, or because uh, you set it up with some invariance at the beginning. And when you, you know, like there's a lock, and the lock is free when you go to free it, then you just put it back on the ob, uh, back on the free list, and when you use it again, you can avoid allocation. So this slab allocator is trying to be extremely efficient. Everything's the same size. It deals with pages directly uh, to uh, avoid any sort of complexities of malloc and so on, and uh, and it even avoids reinitialization. So, okay, um, and in fact, kmalloc, which is the kernel version of malloc, is built on top of a slab allocator. Okay, all right, and uh, this, so the basic idea behind the slab allocator was. 
One, be very efficient if all your objects are the same size that you're malleking freeing. And two, try to avoid the object level initialization over and over again, because they actually at Sun originally did some measurements that showed that that was uh, one of the most expensive parts of allocating and freeing objects was not the memory management malloc part, but the uh, initialization of the object once you allocated it. Okay? All right. And so then here's an example of how you might set up a custom cache. Terminology here is funny. This is not a cache in the way we've been talking about. For task structures that have a certain size, have certain flags to them, and so on, uh, what to do when you run out of memory, panic in certain ways. And then anybody can get a task structure by calling the particular cache uh, uh, by giving it its, the pointer to the cache and uh, what flags you want for allocation, and it'll return you a task structure, and that's using the slab allocation. Okay. All right, and then there's a ways to free it as well. And, uh, okay, I think that's all I really wanted to say. But the point here was we talked about general virtual memory. We talked about the clock algorithm and how it works. When you start looking and you probe into a real operating system, you kind of see what are the actual memory structures. They get pretty interesting pretty quickly, pretty complicated, all right? For instance, just the one last thing I'll point out, every slab allocator in principle can have its own version of the clock algorithm, okay? Because when memory starts to become uh, insufficient, you can go through and start asking each slab allocator, I'd like some pages back. Can you give me free pages? Okay. Are there any questions before we kind of leave this topic and move on to I.O.? Yeah. What do I mean by saving initialization? So, um, so think of this in the context of a an object-oriented programming style. Not doesn't have to be a language because I've shown you C here. And an object, a valid object, always goes through an initialization procedure once it's allocated to get certain fr fields are always consistent in some way. Okay, a great example is there is a lock, and the lock starts out initialized free so that when you use the lock, it makes sense. Um, another example would be there are two fields whose sum is always 12 or something. Okay, so when you f allocate, fr uh, initially allocate memory, you have no idea what's in that memory or whether any of those invariants hold. But once you've gone through initialization, which could be a lot of code, um, then they now hold those invariants. And presumably, if you've been dealing with them correctly, when you free it, it still holds the invariants properly. And so at the time you free, there's really no reason to, when you allocate it again, as long as it's exactly the same memory and the same object, there's no reason to go through the initialization again because presumably you did the right thing when you freed it. Good question. Okay. All right. That's enough of reality. So, uh, welcome back from spring break. Oh, that is reality. I'm sorry. Um, I hope you guys had some fun uh, in addition to work. Um, it was a good spring break. I got my voice back, which was nice. So, um, we're still grading. We're almost done. Uh, it was a long spring break. No, um, so I, my estimates I've heard are we should be done midweek, hopefully by um, section, definitely by section. We're going to hand them out. So, um, and we'll get, I'm hoping that we'll have them done by Wednesday so I can show you what the statistics are. Uh, but that's the goal. So I really apologize. We thought we would be done, and it just didn't quite happen. Um, as you're all well aware, we checkpoint one for project two is due tonight. And so hopefully everybody has heard from their TA about signing up for a design review. Is there anybody who hasn't heard from their TA yet about their design review? Ooh, okay. Hmm. Why don't we have an instructor note to instructors about design reviews? So if you haven't, you have my permission to talk to your TA. <laughs> Send them email or something, because you should have heard of it, okay? Because should, they should be doing them tomorrow or Wednesday or whatever. <laughs>
I don't really have any more Adventist trivia. Uh, questions? Oh, homework student is due tonight, right? Yeah, oh, sorry, I forgot to put that down. I figured, you know, I've already shocked you with welcome back from spring break, but uh, so homework number three. Okay, I think I've covered everything now. All right. Anything else? You can ignore the last one. Perhaps we'll push the deadline on that one a little bit. Um, all right. So, without further ado, uh, every, did everybody find solutions to the exam who wanted to find the solutions to the exam? They're up there. They have been for at least a week. Um, Okay, good. Everybody, there's a new handouts link uh, up on the website. You can read it through, hopefully. If you have any questions about solutions, feel free to get back to your TA or come to me in office hours. We can talk about them. Um, I would suggest before, well, certainly after you get your exam back, I would suggest you go through the solutions and figure out the things that did or did not make sense. One of the things that I'm uh, going to do is if there is a problem or two that seem to have given people particular trouble, I may talk about it on Wednesday, assuming we're graded by then, but um, okay. Um, all right, so where are we? So we've been started with some concepts, we've been talked about concurrency and address spaces and virtual memory a lot, and so now we're kind of working our way into I.O. I mentioned this last time, and uh, you know, this is really the interesting part uh, in our initial couple of days we talked about, well, you got to load a program off of the storage, and maybe you communicate as part of that program through a wireless network to things. And what we missed in that whole discussion was all of this interesting stuff about I.O. Now, I do remember talking a little bit about device drivers, uh, but what I want to do in the, the next week and a half or so is we're going to talk a lot more about the I.O. structure, because I.O. is really uh, where it's at. And um, I've heard many different uh, statistics, and we all know that 37 to 90% uh, of all statistics are wrong, but um, basically, you know, I've heard upwards of 50% and higher of the crashes that happen in modern operating systems are all because of device drivers, all right? And so that's a pretty serious problem, and hopefully we can discuss after we're done talking about I.O. a lot more why that is. Okay, and I think we've already discussed that a little bit, but hopefully this will be clear. I mean, in a picture here, we've been talking about what's going on in the processor. We've been talking about memory. We've been talking about processor scheduling and so on. But once you sort of start talking about I.O., the picture gets much more complicated and muddy. Okay, uh, you know, we've got to have the processors got to be able to... Uh, talk to devices through their I.O. controllers, and some of them have wires, some of them have wireless connections. They've got to be able to initiate direct memory access from uh, the device into main memory, and then there's a subsequent read and write from memory to get the actual data. This kind of loop is really what constitutes the I.O. of a system, and this is pretty interesting, okay? And... What are some requirements of I.O.? Well, we really learned how to manage the CPU and memory, but um, for I.O., of course, one of the things is that without I.O., computers are useless. They're busy contemplating Pi and doing not much else. Um, but the tricky part is there's thousands or millions of different devices. Everyone's slightly different. Uh, devices are unreliable, so some of the times they fail. There are transmission errors. Um, Devices are unpredictable, or they're slow, or they're faster than expected. Why would faster than expected matter? Does that ever matter? Yeah. That's right. So if something sends something, if you get data coming too fast, and the receiver can't handle it, you start dropping things on the floor, and that's a flow control problem. Yeah. So there's lots of interesting problems here, and so somehow we want to come up with a uniform I.O. interface that just works, because everybody wants things that just work, right? 
with dealing with all of these uh, complications. And just to give you some beginnings of things we can talk about, one is what kind of data are we getting back from the device? Are we getting bytes or are we getting blocks? And a block is really a bunch of bytes, but it's a fixed size typically. It might be 4K, or in a disk, it's a 512-byte block, maybe, um, et cetera. So that's one question. Another might be, what's our access pattern? Do we go sequentially, uh, reading things from beginning to end, or can we go randomly? Okay, so sequential, you're all very familiar with, right? What kind of sequential uh, access are you familiar, do you do? Give me a good example. Well, keyboard isn't necessarily sequent. Well, I guess things come sequentially off the keyboard. I'm thinking more off of a file or whatever. What kind of sequential things? What's a good example of sequential access of a file? Huh? Yes. Reading, Reading what? Video. video. Okay. You guys have all watched video, right? Uh, okay. What else is sequential? What are other good examples of sequential operations? Boy, this is just like this morning at my advising session. Everybody's still in, in mode. Go ahead, in uh, spring break. What was that? Doing what with the hard drive? Wiping. Wiping a hard drive. OK, yeah, that's pretty sequential. What else? Actually, usually that's pretty kind of random, too. Yes, go ahead. Okay, network data, sequential. How about scanning through a whole database to find something? Or, you know, there's, or how about reading a file into your editor? There's lots of things that are sequential. In fact, probably when you think about it, most of the operations you do with files are all sequential. And so when we start talking about file systems, we're going to want to optimize for sequential access. What are some good examples of random access? What are some random accesses? Think of files for a moment. When would you ever go to the middle of a file? Yeah. yeah. Great. Reading a row from a database. That's a good example. So lots of things uh, potentially come up in the random case, but actually if you think it through, the sequential case is probably more prevalent and probably has bigger, in many cases, there's much bigger amounts of data that are handled sequentially. Um, another thing we'll talk about, and this is one I'm not going to query you about so much, but we're going to talk about how do we notify that a transfer is either started or completed, and there's going to be both polling and interrupt generation to deal with that, okay? Um, and then we have to talk about how do we actually do the transfer. Do we do a bunch of programmed I.O. or DMA? We'll talk about that as well. Okay, so my point here is really there are actually a lot of questions about I.O. And, and I haven't even talked about um, ways of sort of dealing with latency here. This is just sort of some of the questions we can start asking. So I mentioned this before. I showed you this picture just before spring break, but I, I realize that, uh, you know, spring break's all a blur to everybody. But what's interesting about a typical operating system is we've been talking about the system call interface. Just below the system call interface is kind of all of these things that the system calls can do. We've been working pretty much over on the left side with processes, threads, memory management, so on. We've got a whole nother set of uh, interfaces here to talk about, like file systems or raw devices like keyboards, which were brought up earlier, or networks. So those three file system uh, is sort of a block device. Uh, these device control of TTYs and so on, those are uh, byte devices, and then networking is network devices. Those three classes pretty much uh, are of interest in our topics for the next week and a half or so. And if you notice that the system call interface typically has below it a lot of other code. And so below, for instance, the file system interface, there's something called uh, VFS for the virtual file system, We'll talk about that. What you can plug in is lots of different types of file systems. So you can plug in uh, a FAT file system, which is everybody who has ever had a, uh, a camera and plugged in a little USB key or something, you're probably dealing with a FAT file system. Uh, there are things like NTFS. Uh, 
There is ext3, all of these different file systems. And then below that, that's just the structure. Below this is actually the, de the device itself, like the disk drive. So here's a device driver. So notice that this file system stack has got some interesting pieces to it. Um, when we're talking about raw kind of uh, streaming devices, whatever, the device drivers can get quite varied and quite interesting. And then when we get into networking, there's a whole subsystem that deals with things like TCP IP, uh, packet loss, and so on. And then there's a bunch of drivers underneath that that talk to the network cards. So basically, we're going to look at that sort of left, uh, or excuse me, the right 60% of that diagram. All right, any questions? And one thing I want to note, by the way, is up here, we're probably running threads at minimum, even if we're in the kernel. So up in this kind of top half, we're running at the thread level or process level. Once we get down here, a lot of this code is triggered by interrupts. And it's not actually triggered uh, by, um, well, it's triggered by interrupts in many cases, okay? So we'll have to deal with that split between kind of the processes at one end and the interrupts at the other. So what's the goal? Provide a uniform interface. So I just told you earlier how complicated everything is. Ideally, we would like to make it simple as far as the users are concerned by burying them in enough abstraction. Okay, abstraction is a good thing. Except that what's the downside of abstraction? Yeah. Not flexible enough. That happens sometimes. Good. What else? Yeah. Yeah, not slow, not fast enough. Okay, what else? Anything else? So is hiding complexity a good thing or a bad thing? Hard. Oh, okay, so abstracting may be hard to do well. Yeah, it's true. Because the abstraction, for instance, might not... A good example is a network stream. There's an abstraction that you never lose packets in a TCP IP stream, and yet packets do get lost. So somehow, providing that abstraction, we have to deal with retransmission, we want to optimize for performance, all that sort of stuff under the covers to give this abstraction of a perfect stream of information. That's a good one. Okay. So I wanted to show you this. It's kind of interesting. So you can go to a wide variety of different operating systems and different devices and do something like this. On, For instance, on Unix variants, you could say F open, you could give it dev something, whatever it is, dev HD2A, and say for read write, and then you can go through and print, um, do an F print to that file descriptor, sending data out, and close it, and that same code will work regardless of whether it's a hard drive, a USB key. Um, you can do that uh, with slightly different open interfaces. You can do that with a network socket. Okay, and so the point is that all of the same uh, interfaces all work despite the type of device underneath. So we're clearly abstracting in one way or another. Okay, things are clearly being hidden there. And... Uh, and why? Well, that's because the device drivers and the I.O. subsystem basically gives us some standard interfaces there. So that's kind of interesting, I guess. And we're going to try to get a flavor for what's involved in actually controlling devices in the rest of the lecture, but we're only going to stra scratch the surface. So obviously, we can only get so far. When I teach the advanced OS class, um, people actually learn how to use the VFS interface and, and uh, implement a brand new file system underneath it and so on. So you can do some interesting things like that, but don't worry. We're not going to do that here. So um, are there any questions about this idea of abstraction? Yeah. How do you break the abstraction? So why do you want to do that? Okay, that's a great question. So, what if we want to break the abstraction because not every, let's face it, not every device is exactly the same, right? Otherwise, they wouldn't be different devices, right? So, there are clearly things that don't meet the abstraction, and how do you get access to those? Now, if, you, if you're interested, I would say take a look, pull up your man pages for something called IOCTL, IO Control. Okay, and the I, sometimes it's pronounced I-octal. Some people pronounce it I-octal. I've never quite liked that pronunciation. 
I've never liked that pronunciation. But um, anyway, the point is that every device that you can get at this way, you can do an IOCTO on the file descriptor once it's opened, and typically then you can do all sorts of unique to that device control things. So if it's a display device, you can set its resolution and sort of say how many pixels there are. You know, if it's a networking device, you can set whether it uh, it auto negotiates to between one gigabits and and uh, 100 megabits, or whether it's fixed at 10 megabit. You can do those kind of things typically with ioctal system calls. So that's the catch-all. What do you do if it's non-standard sort of uh, interface? So that's a great question. Yeah. Uh-huh. Okay, so uh so say a little bit more about your question because it may either be philosophical or structural. Okay, great. So the question is, uh, for those of you in cyberspace, basically if, uh, since we're only dealing with bytes, raw bytes without format, does it make it hard for an application programmer to deal with passing in objects or whatever? That's kind of your question. So this is, it is a philosophical question. So I thought I got that right. So um, basically Unix's philosophy is un- structured data at the lowest level, and it's up to the application to figure it out. Okay, and that's uh, that means that all the libraries that you put on top of this need to deal with the fact that it's just raw bytes going in and out. And the simplest example I can give that I think will meet everybody is taking 61B or whatever probably, right? So there's the idea of taking a data structure and serializing it that ring a bell to anybody? But you can take an object that's in memory and you can do what's called serialize on it and it'll turn it into a set of bytes that you can then write, turn it into a string that you can then write out to a file. And if you load it back into memory from the file, you can deserialize it back into the object representation in memory. And so to support this idea of undifferentiated bytes, um, most object-oriented languages have serialization technology. But that's a good question. Did I answer your question? Yeah. Now, um, I will say one thing, though, that um, device or databases that have their own structure and sort of have their own notion of performance will occasionally deal with a raw interface that's purely block-oriented rather than byte-oriented, and then it's up to them to format the bytes or whatever. But um, that's typically the, the raw, like dev, rd, whatever. But um, that's another topic. For... So I wanted to highlight those three types of interfaces that I showed you in green earlier. They're block devices, character devices, and network devices. In some sense, the differentiation here is historical, but we're going to keep it because they tend to have different actual interfaces, uh, different system call interfaces as well. But a block device is anything that reads and writes blocks of data rather than bytes. So great examples are disk drives, tape drives. Yes, there are tape drives in the world. DVDs, okay, these are all things where the minimum quanta in and out might be 512 bytes. Okay, so if I have a block device that I do an F open on and I write to that a few bytes, what has to happen in the operating system to make that work? So the device itself only knows blocks, but I as a user did an F open and wrote a few bytes. What's got to happen there? How do we make that work? Perfect. Very nice. He said, read. The, the operating system says, oh, you only wrote three bytes. I read a block. I put those three bytes into the block, and I write the block back out to disk. Yes. Now, of course, you don't do that for every three bytes you write, because that would be inefficient. So now we've got uh, a block cache, typically inside the operating system, which caches the blocks that are being used so that those single byte reads and writes work. Good. Now, character devices are easy. Those are things like keyboard mice, serial ports. Those take bytes directly and give bytes back directly, and there really is no translation. And notice, by the way, that they tend to have their own separate interfaces, like get and put. There's typically read line, write line kind of system calls and so on. 
And then finally, network devices, which we're going to spend some time on uh, in a couple of weeks, are kind of their own unique things because they're sort of loosely associated with a device, but that device is like a, a wireless card or something, but really the interface is a socket interface. And we talked about sockets in the first few lectures, if you remember. But great examples of these things are Ethernet and wireless and Bluetooth network devices. And they're pretty different from everything else. Um, there's the sockets that you open and close to a socket, and then you make a connection with some remote socket, and then you can do uh, reads and writes to them once you've done that connection. Um, and lots of different things like pipes and FIFOs and streams and queues and mailboxes and so on are all built out of sockets. Okay? Questions? So by the way, it's the differentiation between how different all of these three things are which led to me giving you three different columns in that green figure I showed you earlier because they are very different. Okay. All right. So how do we deal with timing? This is another interesting question. So we've got uh, everything you've done so far has been pretty much a blocking interface, which is you go to do a read and you wait until the data comes back. Okay, or if you do a write, typically the write system call doesn't return until the data's something's happened with the data. It's in the operating system at least. Okay, why is this possibly undesirable under some circumstances? Yes. That's right. Sometimes an I.O. might take a really long time and, gee, you did such a good job of asking for it far enough in advance that why wait for it? Because you can do something else, right? So this wait interface is not good under a lot of circumstances. And that leads to two different types of uh, non-blocking interfaces, one called a non-blocking interface and one called an asynchronous interface. Both of these are things that you can often put a file descriptor into using an ioctal. We brought that up earlier. So if you open a file and then run the right ioctal on it, you can turn it into a non-blocking or an asynchronous interface. And the non-blocking version just says, well, try a read of 100 bytes and return immediately and just tell me how many you got. So give me 100 bytes. And it says, well, here's three. Okay. And then later you say, okay, well, uh, <clears throat> give me 97 bytes. And it says, well, here's four. All right, fine. All right, I really now want, and you just keep, you have to keep doing it until you get everything you want. Okay, that's a, that's a non-blocking interface, and it requires this idea of polling, but you get immediate return. The second one, and you can imagine in a network that that makes a lot of sense in some instances. Well, tell me how much you've got so far and return it right away. The asynchronous interface is, here's a request, I want 100 bytes, here is a procedure to call a signal handler later and signal me when the data is ready. And as long as you don't, and both uh, in the asynchronous case, you've got to hand it a buffer to put the data in and you shouldn't look at the buffer until it says, okay, go look. Okay, and so the difference between non-blocking and asynchronous is in the asynchronous case, it actually notifies you after it's got the whole request satisfied. Yes? Well, so this is, um, so the, the answer to your first question, doesn't this require the programmer to change your program? Definitely. This is, there's, Blocking interfaces are easy to think about. Non-blocking and asynchronous interfaces are not that much harder to think about, but boy, do they require careful consideration, okay? Because you typically have a loop of some sort. The case of the asynchronous one, by the way, isn't really a loop. What asynchronous is doing is it says, notify me later, and that gives you kind of a separate thread of control at that point. Um, so that one isn't so much polling. The non-blocking one's a polling one. But the thought there is that I'm going to be doing a lot of stuff and I'll keep checking every now and then to see how much is ready. Okay. Both of them have their uses. All right. Um, so I did, just to give you, now, so are there any questions on this? Yeah. Yeah. 
Yes. But typically what you could do is you could copy the buffer at that point somewhere else or, you know, if, if you've handed a, if you've allocated a buffer in user memory and you hand it to the kernel and later you find out about it, now that buffer you can put on some linked list for processing or whatever. You can, so you can either copy it out or pass the buffer on to some internal linked list structure you've got at user level later. Okay. Because all the asynchronous notification is telling you is, okay, it's done. <laughs> It's up to you to do the right thing. Okay. So I wanted to say a little bit about um, I.O. and modern processors just to give you a little flavor for it. So Sandy Bridge is a relatively recent processor. It's uh, one and a half generations old now, I think. But uh, I just wanted to give you a flavor for this just so you know what we're talking about here. There's actually four cores. There's a complete GPU graphics controller. There is a complete ring bus. Uh, and a third level cache, which is split up into four pieces. So remember we were talking about uh, caching before. Here's the third level cache. Each one of these cores has a first and second level cache. And all of the I.O. either goes to the graphics controller or out through the systems agent and PCI Express and so on to actually talk to I.O. devices. Okay, so these are, and these chips are probably in your laptops right now. Okay, and this particular chip's got completely integrated I.O. It's got an integrated memory controller with multiple independent channels. It's got a high-speed PCI Express uh, bus for graphics cards. And then it's also got this uh, special DMI connection to the South Bridge for the rest of your I.O. Okay, and so here is the platform controller hub, PCH. And um, I don't know if you can read that or not, but if you look here, this is the processor and the processor directly connects to memory and graphics. And then this DMI interface to the south bridge connects to everything else. And if you take a look, the everything else is pretty interesting, right? So this is audio, a bunch of high-speed PCI Express, serial ATA ports that go to your disk drives, um, firmware and BIOS support. We've got gigabit LAN connections, um, USB Two, this was only 2.0, they have 3.0 now, um, all off of this one chip. So this is I.O. in a modern Intel processor. Okay? Questions? So, you know, you can see this is getting kind of interestingly complicated pretty fast, right? Everybody see that? Now, what's interestingly more complicated about this even is the uh, USB and uh, PCI Express, those are just buses that talk to devices in addition. So when you have a device driver that talks to a disk drive, what's really happening is you're going through the PCI Express or the SATA bus, probably the SATA bus, to talk to the disk drive. And so there's a device driver that both knows how to talk here and how to get out, uh, talk to the bus and to get out to the disk drive. Yes? Uh, question about the language on that slide. Yep. Yeah, so um, it used to be that uh, this was a three-chip picture, okay? So there was, the, there was the processor, there was the north bridge, and there was the south bridge. And the north bridge was the one that handled the, the higher bandwidth stuff. That's right. The north bridge handled DRAM, graphics, et cetera. South bridge handled everything else. Okay. And now what happened is the north bridge got integrated. The south bridge is still a separate chip, but they don't call it a south bridge because there's no north bridge, and so they call it platform controller hub. So there you go. There's a bit of uh, unnecessary detail, but great for parties. Did anybody, did you guys use any of your great details for parties on spring break? Yes? No? There's this professor I've got who's a nut on pi. What's the 20th? Did never. Okay. Um, any other questions about this? So, so here is one view of a modern I.O. subsystem. Look, we've just been looking at on the board. What's this big fan doing here? Yeah, cooling either the GPU or the processor, preventing it from melting. Okay. Um, do you know what the... Uh, no, that's, that's an unnecessary detail. So the, the bridge, the PCI that I just showed you, coming off of the, that uh, platform controller hub, we then go to a PCI bus, 
which has potentially a bunch of cards in it which talk to other buses. So if you have a uh, SCSI or SCSI control of disks, you'd actually have a separate controller. And so to get to these disks, you actually go processor, PCH, PCI bus, SCSI controller, disk drive, and back out again. <laughs> okay? So complexity is kind of interesting, uh, if you like complexity. I just wanted to zoom in on the PCI bus since this is pretty much the standard today. When I started playing with uh, PCs way back when, uh, there was all sorts of complexity in different buses and so on. But now, pretty much we've got a, a nice standard system here where there's a PCI bus which has typically support for this old bus called the ISA bus. Okay, industry standard architecture. Um, does anybody know what legacy devices might fit over here? PS2. Yeah, so different old keyboards. Uh, I'm assuming that's what you mean, PS2 keyboard, yep. But of course, most people have USB keyboards and stuff now, so that's mostly off the USB controllers um, and so on, SCSI controllers. So this is pretty complicated as well. All right, so one last isn't the world complicated picture. By the way, this is supposed to be inspirational. That complexity is fun to deal with, right? So um, I did want to point out, this is a very old slide, but I wanted to show you, if you look at all of the different devices, we have this huge 12-order magnitude difference in, in bit rate from keyboards, which are, you know, 0 .000001, you know, uh, bytes per second at the low end or whatever, up into you know, hypertransport and so on, where we're getting megabits and gigabits and so on. So this huge range is also something that we have to deal with because we have to figure out how the operating system can devote enough CPU to handle a 10 gigabit network, for instance, is one of the hardest things today for a typical processor is dealing with uh, packets coming in at 10 and 40 gigabits. Keyboard, easy. Okay, so a keyboard, you can generate an interrupt for every key and nobody will notice. If you generate an interrupt for every packet coming in off of a 10 or a 40 gigabit network, you're going to lose packets. Okay, you just can't do it. So we have to adapt the way we're programming these devices based on their speed. Okay, 10 orders, 20, 12 orders of magnitude. And this was, uh, this was actually quite a while ago. So the uh, it's probably like, 13 or 14 orders of magnitude now easily. Okay. Questions? All right. So what I want to do is uh, let's take a brief break. It's about that time. Everybody can stand up, say hello to your neighbor. Uh, and uh, then I want to talk a lot more about the actual interfaces into these devices. You get a keyboard for every computer you buy and an old USB mouse. I have many. <laughs> <laughs> 
All right. Let us talk a bit more about how the processor actually talks to devices. And in this level of abstraction, I'm going to kind of ignore those buses because in many cases you set the buses up to just work and then the processor can ignore whether the buses are there. And so uh, obviously we have a processor memory bus and uh, or or with a modern chip as we saw the um, processor memory bu bus is actually on chip and the memory uh, is t attached to the chip. And then the CPU typically has an interrupt controller. This interrupt controller is often on the PCH. Uh, and then a bunch of bus adapters, which basically allow us to talk to device controllers of some sort. This is an abstraction. These device uh, controllers could be over USB, they could be over PCI Express or whatever. But in general, I just wanted to show you this pink box here represents a piece of hardware that's associated with every uh, device. And if you peek inside of it, Obviously, there's an interface that allows it to talk to whatever bus it's on, but then, and then a controller that talks to the device, but then there's a bunch of control registers. Okay, and these control registers are often either in the form of memory, DRAM memory, SRAM memory, what have you, or individual registers that you can read and write directly. Okay, and so, among other things, there's a, these registers are typical configuration registers with bits in them that say, turn this thing, uh, if this is a display, put it in high resolution mode, put it in low resolution mode, what have you. And echoing back to a previous uh, discussion from earlier, if you have an ioctal to this device that you op open up and you want to program it to do something, that ioctal system call eventually goes down and ends up reading and writing these registers to put it into the right mode. Okay, so if you're a hardware designer, you design these controllers. Okay, and these registers typically when you read or write them, something happens. So it's an interesting kind of active register. And um, the memory may either be just for bitmaps where you write some pattern in memory and it shows up on the screen, or they can be memory mapped control things where potentially you write a bunch of triangles, let's say in here, and then you say go and, and the device renders them into a cool 3D image on screen. Okay, so every device typically has uh, one of these two at least and multiple uh, versions of these registers that are directly writable or memory that's active that may or may not have cues in it. And there's basically two ways to talk to a device from the processor level. One of them is what are called I.O. instructions, and these are not supported by too many types of processors, but they are supported by the world's most popular microprocessor, which is the Intel x86 architecture. And... Um, you might actually write an assembly language like this, out ox21, al. What does that say? That says take the byte contents in register al and send it out on port 0x21, okay? And some device knows that 0x21 is uh, something it has to respond to. By the way, in this, the registers start at port 20, hex, 21 hex is this write register, and so it's possible that this bit pattern says put your put the display in high resolution mode, and by executing an out instruction, we put it in high resolution mode. Okay, how many people have ever heard of uh, I.O. instructions before? They probably don't talk much about these in 61C, right? These are, these are a little obscure, except for the fact that the x86 uses them and a few other architectures, and by the way, there's a lot of I.O. devices that still have out and in uh, instructions that access them. The more common and more universal way of doing it stuff is called memory mapped I.O., and the idea behind memory mapped I.O. is there's certain physical addresses that rather than being DRAM, these physical addresses actually end up reading and writing things on the device itself. And so you could have a range of memory that goes to DRAM, and then you can have a range of memory addresses that ends up talking to your display controller. Okay, how many people have ever programmed memory mapped I.O. devices before? Any of you? Okay, a few of you. 
Okay, does everybody understand the distinction here? Anybody have a question about this distinction? So the access, by the way, to the memory mapped I.O. is simple load and store instructions. So the kernel has to make sure that it has memory uh, access to this physical memory. If you want to give this to a uh, user pro uh, process, you can actually map the physical addresses that are represented here into the user's address space, and then they can read and write that device directly at user level. Okay. So um, here's an example of a memory map display controller. What I've done here is shown you that, oh, gee, there are some physical addresses for this controller. It turns out that 7F000 and 7F004 happen to be two registers in memory space, and then 0x8000F000 happen to be the beginning of display memory and graphics command queue memory. And uh, basically, as long as the processor uses these physical addresses, the right thing happens. Question, yeah. Say that again? Ah, so um, good question. What happens if two devices pick the same memory? So in the, in the old days, you had to actually set jumpers because memory conflicts would screw everything up. Today, all of the buses you're likely to deal with, PCI, uh, USB, they all auto-negotiate these addresses as part of the boot process. And so these addresses get set so they don't conflict with other devices, and then you have to make sure that the device drivers know how to find out what the addresses are. Uh, you know, if you have a malicious device and you plug it into your machine, you're toast anyway, basically. Uh, don't do that. That's bad. Um, they, they basically, um, you know, there's, there's some attempt to deal with non-functioning devices, but if you truly had a malicious device, it, you, it could bypass what goes on. Question, yeah. That's mostly correct. The question is, do these addresses never point to real memory? It's possible in some instances for them to overlay real memory, so the real memory uh, that was at those addresses is now unusable. That happens in some instances, and a good example where that happens you, all the time is uh, the BIOS may have physical addresses, but you can map DRAM ver or you know uh, non-volatile RAM versions on top of it in some instances. So, question, yeah. Ah, how do you solve synchronizations between the CPU and the device? Um, very carefully. <laughs> um, you know, what you've got to do in typical, typically, if the if synchronization's an issue, then there's a synchronization protocol where, you know, set this bit on, gets you the lock, then you do some stuff, turn the bit off. So there, there might be customized protocols for that. Yeah. So this, uh, so by the way, I, I just clicked through here, but you get the idea here. This is just writing in different parts of this memory cause different things to happen, like writing to the command. Oh, let me hold that question for just a second. Writing to the command uh, register causes something to happen. Maybe you put um, commands uh, in the graphics command queue might be specially formatted uh, triangles that are going to get rendered, and then you type a command in the command field, and the graphics controller goes and looks at those lists of things to do and renders it at that point, okay? So there's protocols you have to go through. The question here was, does the kernel, the pending question was, does the kernel protect against malicious or, or the other random rights to the device? And if the kernel screws up, it's, uh, if the kernel device driver is broken, there's nothing the kernel can do about it because these, you know, the kernel has got privilege and can directly write in here. The way user programs, by definition, don't have access to this unless the kernel has chosen to map this physical address range into some process's uh, virtual memory space. So the kernel has control over which processes can do this. The kernel, unless it's a um, microkernel or something, if it's got a bug in it, you're toast again. So bad kernel is usually something to avoid at all costs. Did I answer your question? Good. Any questions on this? Memory mapped I.O., by the way, is very common. Yeah, go in the back first. 
Well, I had, as I sort of mentioned that earlier, it may mean that part of your DRAM is inaccessible, but what it usually means is that this, these addresses are in a part that aren't part of your DRAM. So in a 64-bit processor, there's lots of address space. Um, in the, if, you have, if you're tight on physical address space, then yes, this might actually end up making parts of the DRAM inaccessible after the configuration happens. There's another question. Did that answer your question? Question down here. So that's a great question. So are, are these, so first of all, I would not call these uh, memory map regions of RAM. I would say they're memory mapped I.O. regions because it may or may not have RAM. All, all we know is that we can load and store to talk to it. The good question, the really good underlying question here is, is this right through or right back? And the answer is, uh, typically what you do is, uh, if you look back when I showed you the page table entry format for x86, for instance, I remember with the little P bit and the U bit and the dirty bit and so on. There are cacheable and uncacheable bits that say certain mapping things ought to go right through the cache and don't uh, not be cached at all. And so uh, these addresses need to be mapped as uncacheable, otherwise you're going to get really weird behavior. Because if you thought you were writing a command and it got only stuck in the upper level cache and never went out, then um, no command happens because it's actually got to go down to the physical bus. So anyway, so the so short answer to your question is those are marked as uncached. So if I wanted to write a large amount of data out, like you just said, that would be on your I.O. and that would be for every byte that you want to store. Well, it's not the thing is it's it's uh it's the equivalent of uh Writing to DRAM with a bunch of cache misses is not writing to a disk. It's not slow because it's at the same speed as you get at the DRAM bus in many cases. So, um, but yeah, it has to get from the processor all the way out to the periphery. Otherwise, you're not getting anything. Now, some of this stuff like display memory, you can make this as cacheable in the regular cache, and then you can write a bunch and then flush it if you wanted to, and that may be more efficient in some instances. But things like commands, where you need to have immediate access that's got to be uncacheable, otherwise you're going to get really weird behavior that you just don't understand. So, but anyway, part, part of, you can see how that happens is take a look at those uh, page table entries. That's one way to make things uncacheable. Okay, good. Any other questions? CIO is more exciting than you thought. Either that or you're slowly realizing that spring break is over and you're awake. Um, okay, so um, how do we transfer data to and from a controller? So this is going to answer your question a little bit more, I think. Um, so there are two options here for actually getting the data out. And I think your mental model of what you do when you have to transfer a lot of data is you do store, 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 store. And that is slow under all circumstances. But typically that's called programmed I.O., where every byte is transferred because the processor is doing either an in and an out or a load in a store. And um, the pros of this are it's really simple to think about. It's really simple to program. The con is that you're tying up the processor for every byte that goes out. Okay. The better thing to do is what's called direct memory access. And this is basically giving the controller access to the memory bus and saying, here is a chunk of DRAM that I want to go to the display controller please transfer it to the display controller addresses, and then you say go, and there's a hardware controller that does that, and the processor is completely out of the loop. Okay? So um, here is actually a picture from, uh, from the Dragon book, dinosaur book, sorry, that basically says, oh, the device driver, uh, please transfer, for instance, disk data to a buffer at address X. So this is kind of going back the other way. The device driver... Um, tells the disk controller uh, that information by giving sort of the addresses involved and the uh, blocks off the disk. And then um, typically that's a, here's an address and here's a length. And then at that point, the disk controller, in combination with a DMA controller, automatically pulls things off the disk, goes over the bus, and puts them in memory, and there's no processor involved. This is what's called direct memory access. Okay, and so all efficient disk access, when you're reading things off of disk, what's really happening is the processor is programming the DMA controller 
which talks to the disk controller, which pulls them off of disk and puts them into buffers in memory, and the processor is not involved other than getting an interrupt when all is said and done. Okay? Good. Now, this is potentially important difference. I want to make sure everybody catches the difference between programmed I.O. and DMA. Are there any other questions on that? Does DMA make sense to everybody? Yeah, question. In this, uh, yes, I'll say they're physical. Yes. Not always, but in this instance, yes. Mostly DMA is physical. Um, I, and that's kind of, by the way, remember what we said earlier about how there was a physical DMA range? Um, in the old days, eh, way back when, these DMA controllers couldn't handle things that were any bit farther than in the first 16 megabytes. And so you had to actually make sure that this destination RAM was in the right range so that this transfer could happen. Pretty much that's no longer a constraint except for really kind of specialized older devices that can't do, do anything else. But pretty much you can DMA into a much wider range of memory now. So, good. Other questions? So pretty much, if you're transferring large blocks of memory, it's always direct mem memory access. Otherwise, uh, people typically do programmed I.O. if you're pulling in one or two bytes here and there. So keyboard drivers are programmed I.O. You know, mouse drivers are programmed I.O. Disks, tapes, everything pretty much direct memory access. I keep saying tape as if tape exists anymore, but it does. I hear that vinyl's coming back. Um, but I've never actually seen anybody put bits on vinyl. I'm sure they've done. But um, So then, one last thing in this whole sort of general topic of talking. The OS needs to know when either the device is finished in operation or there's an error. And, a, you know, for instance, that DMA. We started the DMA. How do we know when it's done? Well, later we get an I.O. operation. And so one option here is to actually have an interrupt where the device generates an interrupt or the DMA controller says, I'm done. Okay, and the pros of this is it works really well for unpredictable events. Suppose I have no idea how long it's going to take. I just say, give me an interrupt when you're done. The con is that interrupts have a lot of overhead. Remember, we talked a bit about interrupts at the beginning. You've got to save out registers. You've got to do all this stuff. You've got to save the context. Then you've got to do what you're going to do. Then you've got to come back. So polling is another option where you just say, are you done yet? Are you done yet? Are you done yet? Okay, so... Good thing about polling is the overhead's extremely low because all you're doing typically is an in uh, operation or a single load off of a device register. The con is that if the thing you're polling for is unpredictable, then you're going to waste a lot of cycles asking if you're done yet. Okay, so it's a trade-off. I.O. is great for uh, unpredictable things. Polling is much better for things that are predictable. And furthermore, actual devices today combine both polling and interrupts. So pretty much when we hit the 10 gigabit per second network uh, interface, it was no longer possible to actually have every network packet generate an interrupt because the processors are just not fast enough. Okay. Now, as we've gotten more cores in a multi-core and we've been able to, div to distribute interrupts in hardware to different cores, that's gotten a little better. But by and large, what actually happens with a network interface is during long periods of no packets, nothing happens. Did you guys all catch that? That's very important. And then when a packet comes in, it generates an interrupt. And presumably when a packet comes in, there's often a lot of packets that follow right away in a burst. And so what happens is the first packet that comes in generates an interrupt, the device driver then turns off interrupts and starts polling for subsequent packets so that it can very efficiently pull in all of the packets that are in a burst, and then it turns interrupts back on when the queue is empty and goes back. Okay, so that com combination of interrupts and polling means the interrupt is only handled, uh, handling that unpredictable event where there uh, hasn't been a packet in a while, and the polling is used to get the high bandwidth out of it. And that combination of polling and interrupts is a very good thing. Okay? Question, yeah. 
So um, I wouldn't. So is there a cache on the uh, network card that's queuing packets? I wouldn't call it a cache. I'd call it a queue. But yeah, there's memory on the network card that typically has lots of uh, space for packets. But if you wait too long, then that queue fills up and it has to start dumping packets. Good. Okay. So what's a device driver in all of this? So a device driver, I actually said this at the beginning of the term, is device-specific code in the kernel that interacts directly with the device. And it supports uh, the standard interfaces up and inter internal interfaces down. So it says, oh, I know how to open, read, write, close, whatever. And then downward, I know how to talk to the network device and turn off the interrupts and do all this sort of complicated device-specific stuff. So a driver is really presenting a set of standard interfaces to complicated hardware. And by the way, the device driver is the thing that's doing the ioctl. That's how you spell it, by the way, I-O-C-T-L. How many people think that should be I-O-C-T-L? Good, good, good. I octal. Um, anyway, so uh, the device driver is specific to the device, <coughs> and they're divided into two pieces, top and bottom half. Now, what's uh, unfortunate about this nomenclature is, depending on whether you're talking about Linux or not, <laughs> top and bottom half have different meanings. <laughs> but... Um, We'll do the normal thing since this is not a Linux class. So the top half is when you stick that green diagram I showed you earlier, the top half is the part that's above, and the bottom half is the part that's altogether now below. Okay? So the top half handles uh, system call uh, traffic coming in from processes, whereas the bottom half is the part of the device driver that handles interrupts. Okay? Does that make sense to everybody? Right, interrupts are coming from below, processes from above. I will tell you, in Linux, they're swapped. <laughs> okay. What's called a bottom half and a top half is different in Linux, and don't ask me why, I guess just because they can. All right. Um, it's funny, every device, uh, or every book I've read on Linux device drivers, and there are several of them, all have somewhere in the early first chapter trying to explain why this difference is and the fact that things, you know, it's historical and it was just that way. But anyway, for now, in this class, top half is the part that the processes touch and the bottom and the system calls and the bottom half is the interrupts, okay? And so, um, really, the top half is implementing the, some standards here, which are cross-device system calls, open, close, read, write, ioctl, strategy, so on. These are not quite system calls in the sense that um, they're things that the user uses directly because you don't, you could look till you're blue in the face and you will not find a strategy system call from user level. Okay. But these are standard calls that the uh, IO system knows how to talk to. Okay. All right. And here is kind of a good life cycle of an IO request. I just wanted to tie this all together. So if you request some IO, and it makes a system call. So let's suppose we're doing a read from a device driver, from a disk, excuse me, when I read from a file. What happens is the, right after the system call, the kernel I.O. subsystem says, hey, can we satisfy this request? Now, if you remember earlier, I asked, well, gee, I've got a block device, and I either read or write a few bytes. What happens? Well, we read blocks into the block cache. So that little diamond decision thing might say, gee, is the data they're asking for already in my block cache? In which case... Good, I'll just return it to them. Oops, sorry. Okay, so in that case, this particular path could be very fast. If not, then I've got to do a little more work. And in that point, um, I send the request to the actual device driver. And notice this, by the way, is completely device-independent code up here. But now I take over the top half of the device driver. In that point, it press, processes the request, decides what to do, and issues it to the actual controller... And the controller at that point um, takes over and the hardware starts doing stuff. Now, if I'm going to ask a disk drive to do a read, what do I know about this process here? What should I do with it? It's about to read off of the disk. What should I do with that process? Put it to sleep, right? Because how many instructions does it take to read a disk? Million. Good. That, if there are no other numbers other than pi that you learn in this class, you should learn a million instructions to talk to the disk, okay? So um, so basically, this top half of the device driver is going to put that process to sleep. 
okay? That thread of control and um, tell the scheduler to do something else. And meanwhile, this device hardware is going to work in parallel doing some stuff. It's going to read the data. It's going to cause an interrupt saying, I'm done. And at that point, the bottom half receives the interrupt, puts the data somewhere it's supposed to inside the device driver, and then calls the top half. Okay, and by the way, calling the top half actually involves uh, returning from interrupt, but setting it up so the top uh, device driver top half will wake up the process and keep executing. Okay, and so then it, we return back up. Okay, questions? Everybody good on this? Okay, so let's uh, say in conclusion, we talked about lots of I.O. device types. Many different speeds, different access patterns, different access timing. Um, hopefully introduce some new types of access you guys should check out. Non-blocking and asynchronous are available. We talked about I.O. controllers being hardware that controls the device. And uh, you saw about um, uh, I.O. instructions versus memory mapped I.O. We talked about polling versus interrupts. Uh, we've talked about uh, polling versus interrupts, yep. And we've also talked about ways that drivers interface to I.O. devices by providing a clean read-write interface, but then doing programmed I.O. and DMA underneath. Next time, we're going to pick up, uh, we're going to talk a lot more about devices uh, such as disks, and um, we'll talk about SSDs, and we'll also talk about some queuing theory, so you'll get some actual mathematics. Don't scare that. It's actually easy to understand. And uh, well, then we'll move into file systems. So see you guys on Wednesday. Don't forget, got a bunch of things to do, including solving the halting problem by midnight. Don't forget. For those of you in webland, I'm, I'm kidding. <laughs>